Hello and welcome everyone to this session of the uh, Open Source Summit uh, 2021. As you might have guessed, this is not an in-person session. Um, unfortunately, the current situation did not allow travel to Seattle. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, um, I think this is a great event, uh, even virtually, and uh, I'll hope, I hope you enjoy this session. Um, my name is Christian Browner. I work as a, a software engineer at Canonical, which is the company behind um, Ubuntu. And uh, I'm part of the team that is responsible for developing LexD. Um, LexD is a container and virtual machine manager. Consequently, it allows you to run containers and virtual machines. It's a bit different from application container managers such as Docker or Podman and RunC in that it focuses on running full system containers and it can be managed and treated just like virtual machines. And so Lexi uses Lexi to run containers underneath. And I'm also the maintainer for uh, and developer for Lexi, um, which is a shared library which provides a simple API um, to uh, run containers. Um, and uh, we also develop and maintain LexiFS, which is a tiny fuse file system, which provides a virtualized view of uh, various system resources. Um, and in addition to that, and this is uh, mostly relevant for the talk today, I spend and maintain, uh, uh, I spend a lot of time uh, and maintain and develop various stuff in the upstream kernel. Um, I do development in um, a lot of different areas, uh, that, uh, or nearly all areas that kind of touch containers, but uh, I also have a focus on some aspects uh, of process management and on file system abstractions. And uh, today we're going to look at a feature that uh, Together has just recently uh, landed in the upstream kernel, uh, which we developed and which greatly expands what one can do with file systems for various use cases. So we're going to take a look at uh, what um, I call ID map mounts. Um, so for a quick outline of what we're roughly going to be talking about today, um, first we're going to be look at how file ownership can be changed uh, or by what it is affected by and how uh, file ownership is usually uh, expressed on a standard Linux system. And we're also going to look at various limitations of this ownership model and uh, take a look at various use cases uh, that can that can be dealt with nicely in the current model and with the current tool set that we have. And finally, we're going to introduce ID map mounts um, and explain how they make file ownership more flexible and how they can be used to solve use cases uh, that we will mention earlier uh, in the talk. And last, if time permits, we're also going to do a simple demo. This is not so much about looking in the, into the actual uh, implementation. Um, I will be giving talks uh, um, at other conferences about this, uh, probably, but this is sort of more understanding what is the, what is the motivation and what can this actually uh, help, by, uh, help you with. So, um, file ownership. Well, on a standard Linux system, file ownership is expressed through UIDs and GIDs, obviously. And uh, most people will be familiar with this, right? So note that uh, UIDs and GIDs are not universal. Um, they're neither universal across uh, operating systems nor across uh, file systems within a single operating system. So for example, Windows file systems usually don't implement UIDs and GIDs. Um, they might still provide a form of ownership, but it is usually different from what we understand as ownership on Linux. Um, and similarly, uh, some file systems might not support UIDs and GIDs at all, or support them in a very limited form only. So for example, the VFAT file system uh, implementation on Linux only provides a very rudimentary UID and GID support and all files are owned by the same UID and GID and ownership can freely be altered in a meaningful way apart from um, remounting the file systems. And also some networking file systems uh, won't really or don't necessarily need to impl implement a full UID GID concept. Uh, like we are used to with standard file systems such as X4, XFS, or uh, ButterFS. 
So if you look around your file system in a terminal, you will see that all files will have ownership information associated with them, with them right? So this ownership information uh, is visible uh, in the output of LS, which usually shows it in the form of user names and, and group names. So if we go into my home directory, you can see there's Brown or Browner, which is my local user. And, but you can also display uh, the raw uh, UID and GID values uh, with the LS tool. And then you can see that my UID and GID on this system um, are, uh, is 1000. Is 1, and uh, this association between UIDs and uh, GIDs and group names is arbitrary for the most part. Um, although quite a lot of uh, tools will pick standard names for their UIDs and GIDs, but there is the, there is no necessity, there is no uh, 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 really necessary coupling between UIDs, GIDs, and so the, the raw numbers and names. Uh, one thing to note is that this ownership information is persistent. Um, this is something that we're going to be touching on later in the talk, um, and what I mean by this is. Uh, that if I turn off my computer and I restart it again, or if I unplug an external disk and plug it in again, or a USB stick, the ownership information will uh, still be the same. There are a few things that you can do to alter this actually, but overall uh, the ownership information can't be easily altered. We will see how it can be altered in a little bit. Um, the association between the IDs and the names, for example, might have changed, um, but of course the raw UID and GID values are usually the same. And so file systems such as uh, XFS, X4, uh, and ButterFS uh, and loads of others uh, will store ownership information on the device itself, uh, the underlying device itself. So an SSD disk, your hard disk, a USB stick, whatever it may be, your phone's disk. Um, so if I create a new file system, uh, if I create a new file in the file system, it will record the ownership information associated with this new file by recording or storing a UID and GID onto the device. This is information that is on disk metadata about the file or about the data, sure. Um, and this allows the kernel to retrieve the ownership information uh, when the device shows uh, back up later, which is going to be... Uh, which we're going to be talking about uh, now, actually. Um, and this brings us to an important st uh, step when dealing with file systems on Linux. Uh, when a new disk device, uh, be it a disk in your laptop or desktop or your phone, or an external disk or USB stick shows up, the kernel needs to be told to make the files and directories avail available somewhere in the file system uh, hierarchy. The kernel won't just randomly mount any device or make the device and make the files available and we will briefly touch on why it, it probably shouldn't do this. Um, so in order to expose a file system in the file system hierarchy, uh, the kernel needs to uh, create a new super block, uh, which is done when the file system is mounted for the first time. And uh, the super block is a kernel, it's nothing but a kernel internal data structure that exists for as long as the file system is mounted and records various information and state about the uh, mounted file systems, file system type and so on, inode size, whatever it may be. And uh, once the super block has been created and the file system has been exposed in the file system hierarchy, the files and directories can be accessed by users on the system wherever it uh, may have been uh, mounted. So. Um, in order to facilitate very fast access times, the kernel maintains various caches, right? Including the so-called D cache or Dentry cache and the I cache or iNode cache. We're not going to be concerned with the D cache and we will only be concerned in a, in a very high level sense with the uh, I cache here. Um, uh, suffice it to say that it would be very costly if every time the kernel needed to do permission checking, it would need to call into the actual file system and query that file system for um, information about the state of a given file. It would slow things very, very, uh, yeah, would sl things slow things down very much, and you would notice this probably pretty, uh, pretty quickly. 
So um, the iCache is a cache for inodes and the kernel maintains an inode in this iCache for each file and directory on disk. Um, so a file is uh, skipping over a few details. Uh, uniquely, uh, a file or directory is uniquely, uh, uniquely identified by um, an inode. And um, there's obviously a bit more to it. Like the, when you mount the file system, the kernel obviously is not going to go through all of the file system and uh, create cache entries for all of the inodes. It will obviously lazily create uh, um, inodes in, in the cache. And um, it, it's also important to note that it is different from file system specific inode structures. Uh, what we see here on the slide is the VFS inode structure, which is a generic abstraction, so to speak, by the, uh, which is used by the VF inodes cache to represent files or directories. And when a file is not found, then uh, in the iCache, a new VFS inode is allocated and the file system will fill in various fields with the information of the file that is stored um, on disk. And as you might have guessed, uh, the VFS inode structure uh, also records ownership information, which you can see right here in the uh, IUID and IGID um, field. So uh, here to be precise. Um, and uh, once that ownership information has been filled in, it will be used to determine if and how a caller can access or alter a given file or directory. And so this information is relatively stable. The VF VFS can generally expect that ownership isn't changed constantly for a given file or um, di directory. Um, there are, of course, a lot of cases where ownership of a file needs to be changed or, or updated. Um, and in order to change uh, ownership, the caller can use uh, one of the Chone system calls, uh, which we see on this slide right here. There are a bunch of them, as you can see, they all have slightly different semantics. Um, and the caller can, but for all of them, the caller can specify a UID and GID, uh, and for the file and directory, uh, and uh, it is supposed to be changed to, and then ownership uh, will be changed. Of course, uh, this is restricted to a sufficiently privileged caller. An unprivileged caller can just change the UID and GID associated with uh, a file uh, to any other UID and GID. There are various restrictions in place um, that ensure that changing ownership only happens when it is safe to do so. Otherwise, an unprivileged user could, for example, um, change Etsy Shadow to be owned by any user, including themselves, which obviously would be very bad. So um, one of the drawbacks of Chone is that it is a relatively costly operation. In order to change ownership, uh, not just you need, uh, do you need to take various locks in the kernel, and ultimately the VFS inode structure needs to be updated and at some point uh, written back to disk as well. It's also the context switch that uh, calling into the kernel will incur. And for various use cases, uh, we must even change ownership for a whole root file system or for a really, really large directory um, or a complete file system. And uh, if the file system contains a lot of files, and directories, this becomes very costly and in quite a few circumstances prohibitively costly, uh, such that it needs to be avoided at all costs, let alone the possibility that a recursive choning operation for a file system or a large directory might also fail for whatever reason. Um, and uh, if you don't handle this correctly, or if you didn't expect this, um, then you end up with a half choned directory or a half shown file system, which is inconsistent and to recover this is usually very, very difficult. It's not, uh, it's not great. Uh, so um, another way to change file ownership is by making it possible to mount a file system inside of a username space. In order uh, to understand how this works, we will briefly take a look at what a username space is but we won't go into it uh, in, in, into any depth simply because we'll, it would be too much time. So in short, username spaces are an important building block of uh, safe containers. Um, and they isolate UIDs and GIDs as well as capabilities and other privileged concepts uh, on Linux. Uh, 
So they achieved this by establishing mappings between ranges of UIDs and GIDs. So for example, um, I can create a user namespace where UID 1000 is mapped to UID 0, and this means that a process running with UID 0, uh, with UID 1000 inside of a user namespace will appear to be running with UID and GID 0. Um, but if we look at this process from the outside, then uh, we can see that it is actually running with UID and GID 1000. So I've, I've put this on the slide just with a, a slightly different example. Um, let's assume we have a, we have a, a user ID of uh, 100,000 uh, outside of a user namespace, uh, which is mapped to UID 0 inside of this user namespace. And if I look at a file from outside this user namespace, I can see that it is owned uh, by UID and GID 100,000. And if I look at it from inside of such a user namespace with such a mapping holds, then I can see that this file, is appear the file appears to be owned by, by root. Um, the nice cement, the nice uh, consequence of, uh, of such mappings is that when a process breaks out of a container that runs with UID 1000 or is, uh, is located inside of the user namespace with such a mapping and it breaks out of a container, it can, can only do as much damage, damage as uh, our privilege are assigned to this specific UID and GID and usually uh, UID 100,000 will not have assigned any, any privileges. Um, yeah, and these mappings are known as ID mappings, as you can see. And they will play a crucial role when we look at ID map mounts in a little bit. Um, so one uh, uh, other way of affecting ownership uh, of files uh, stored on disk is by making them uh, mountable, making the file system mountable inside of a, a user namespace. And they will take the ID mapping information associated with that user namespace into account at uh, the point in time when they are mounted. What this means is that when the VFS allocates a new inode and the file system fills in the ownership information, it will map the ownership information as stored on disk according to the ID mapping associated with the user namespace. So for example, Going back to the example from uh, before, when we looked at the inode cache and the VFS specific inode structure, uh, if the user namespace has an ID mapping associated with it that maps UID 0 to UID 1000, then any file that is stored as being owned by UID 0 on disk will be recorded as being owned by UID 1000 in the VFS inode cache. So the actual raw device ID that is stored on disk is mapped to something else at the time of uh, mount, mounting the file system. So this is a one-time read the inode, create an inode cache entry for this given file, but apply the ID mapping before storing the UID and GID into the VFS inode structure. Um, so, but there are various limitations with uh, with both approaches. Um, so first, let's let's look at Chone. Uh, the Chone approach has various limitations. Uh, first of all, the obvious drawback is that file ownership is always altered globally and permanently. Um, that means if you change uh, ownership of a file, it will be changed for everyone on the system and everywhere that file system is exposed. And it is also persistent, permanent, as the ownership change will be written back to disk, usually, for, for most file systems. So if the file system is unmounted and mounted again, the uh, change in ownership will still be in effect, which is usually what you want with shown, obviously. Uh, I'm not criticizing the implementation itself, but it's a, it's a, uh, it's, uh, uh, can be an unwanted consequence. And the other drawback was already mentioned is that shoning whole file systems is very costly. And it's also not easy to actually write uh, uh, coherent code to do it. So uh, what about mounting, mounting file systems in uh, user namespaces? Um, this has similar drawbacks um, and some other ones. Uh, the file ownership is changed for everyone on the system and everywhere the file system is exposed. That's the same as for uh, Chilm. Um, one advantage is that file ownership is somewhat changed temporarily in 
that if I unmount that file system and mount it outside of any user namespace, where there will be no ID mapping in play, then the on-disk ownership will correspond to the iCache uh, ownership. Um, and of course, uh, it's one way to allow the cost of a recursive chum. But um, in addition to the aforementioned problems, most file systems cannot be mounted inside of such user namespaces as the creation of a superblock is a privileged operation for nearly all file systems. And there is a good reason for this, namely to protect against malicious and corrupt uh, file system images. An unprivileged user should not be able to mount a random device as this can be used to, uh, to attack the kernel. And only some file systems can be mounted inside user namespaces. Uh, and usually these include uh, so-called pseudo file systems, so file systems that don't really deal with uh, real devices. Um, so for example, procfs or sysfs, uh, devpts, or uh, in, in newer kernels, overlayfs. And most of these file systems uh, aren't really that interesting, apart maybe from overlayers, because they don't include file systems we really care about, such as X4, XFS, uh, or ButterFS, which is where usually uh, we are most interested interested in changing ownership information in a uh, in an easy way, um, and want to expose it to multiple users. Um, so. With these limitations in mind, or with the current tool set in mind, so we can either uh, chone, recursively chone um, a set of files, or we can mount a file system inside of a user namespace, let's look at some use cases that have emerged over the years and how they can be handled with our current tool set. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is that uh, newer systemd versions introduce a concept called portable uh, home directories. And the idea is roughly to provide a way to make your home directory, to take your home directory from one computer to another without much ha hassle. And while that sounds trivial at first, it really isn't because there is no guarantee that you will be assigned the same ID on different computers. So think about a shared uh, university workstation. You might have UID 1000 on your local Linux machine, but it is highly unlikely that you will have UID 1000 on that uni workstation, workstation where there are a lot more users maybe already registered. Instead, you might have something, might have been assigned something like 1125 or 1001. And uh, when you bring your home directory on a USB stick or an external SSD disk to that computer, you usually have a problem because all files and disks will be owned by UID and GID 1000, but your login UID and GID uh, will be 1125, for example. And that has the consequence now you can interact with any of the files on disk, annoying. And you can't change ownership because you can't use your SSH keys, you might not be able to access directories or even create files. Um, so one alternative is obviously to recursively show the whole home directory each time you change computers. So when you go to the university, a recursive chone operation is applied, for example, by systemd, um, and uh, then you can interact with uh, your home directory. Then you go back home to your computer, you plug back in your uh, external home directory, and the recursive chone operation happens again. Sounds costly, also sounds dangerous. <laughs> um, uh, especially considering that a lot of home directories nowadays contain huge amounts of data, uh, files and directories. So you also might face the problem that the recursive chone fails, right? I've uh, briefly mentioned this before. Uh, so you might end up with a partially changed file system, which also sounds rather nasty. Okay, so, but maybe we can just mount it inside of a user namespace. Well, that could work, but as we've seen, it's unlikely that the file system you're uh, interested in or that you're using, in, uh, using on your home directory will actually support that. So um, it also means um, that you will lose a lot of privileges uh, as you will also need a new mount namespace and you will probably need to be located inside of the user namespace to even be able to mount this directory, uh, the file system and to be able to interact with this. So all of the regular behavior that you would expect uh, is now gone. Uh, 
and uh, this doesn't really work either. It's not a very uh, pleasant, uh, pleasant solution. So um, another huge uh, set of uh, use cases comes actually from uh, from containers. Um, so root file system ownership, for example, is the first uh, the first example we we can look at. Um, what I mean by this is uh, when you have a container that is an unprivileged container, so a container that makes use of user namespaces and ID mappings, uh, you will usually, not usually, you will need to change the directory, the root file system that the container uses uh, to match uh, with the ID mapping of the container. So the files on disk need to be owned by the UIDs and GIDs delegated to the container in the ID mapping of the user namespace. Otherwise, you face similar problems as in the portable home directory case that there are random UIDs and GIDs on disk that don't mean anything in your user namespace and you can't interact with the root file system. Okay, the container won't boot. It's uh, not a workable solution. Um, again, here we have the option to recursively churn the root file system, which nowadays is what most uh, implementations do or to mount it inside of the user namespace of the container, which again is uh, problematic because of the limited support for file systems and also uh, and, and for other reasons uh, we mentioned before. So another use case is data sharing between the host and a container. So often you will have a scenario where you want to share your home directory, for example, with uh, the container, with an unprivileged container, or some data that you want the container to have access to. And uh, once again, if the container needs to be able to write files um, and lacks permissions aren't really an option, then the solution is to recursively churn uh, the the uh, directory that you're going to share with it obviously is annoying um, because then you will alter the ownership permanently and for the host as well especially uh, with your home directory this might not be what you wanted you also might not want to punch a hole in the containers id map such that uid 1000 outside and inside of the container correspond to each other because that would mean it get access to technically access to all files um, that get added to the container uh, with UID and GID 1000 and we can't really mount the file system inside of the user namespace of the container because it is already mounted on the host and also because because we wouldn't be able to share it with the host if we did mount it in the container not easily at least so again we run into quite a few limitations. And then we have the uh, have another case where we want to share data between um, different unprivileged containers which have different ID mappings which you might want to use to increase the isolation between different containers. Um, and in this case you're really in a pickle because your container will likely always end up with files they can't interact with because choning to the ID mapping of one container will render it inaccessible to the other one. And the same uh, logic, the same thinking also applies to uh, mounting the uh, shared data inside one of those containers. So it seems we have reached an impasse right now. Our current tool set uh, has too many limitations to handle these use cases elegantly. And uh, however, the idea of ID map mounts uh, allows to solve these use cases and hopefully I can show you how. Um, so in order to solve these use cases we looked at above, we need, we obviously seem to need a way to expose the same set of files at multiple locations but with different ownership. This is sort of the goal, this is, this is, this is what we want to address this problem. Um, if we look closely, we don't really need to reinvent a lot of things, right? So, because if you break the statement down, you see there are multiple problems in this series. Like, first of all, um, you want to uh, expose the same set of files at multiple locations. And Linux already provides a way to expose the same set of uh, files at multiple locations in the form of mounts, or more precisely, bind mounts. And there are 
various de definitions that you can give of bind mounts, but essentially a, a mount or bind mount is a mount of a directory or a file of an already mounted file system to another or the same location uh, within the file system. So for example, I could bind mount my slash temp folder to slash mount, and this would cause the same set of files to be exposed uh, that are exposed at slash, slash temp to be exposed at slash mount. And in addition, the kernel already allows to specify different properties for different mounts. So that's great as well. Uh, so mounts have have uh, additional properties uh, we need for, to solve this problem. So first of all, the changes associated with a given mount are restricted to uh, the specific mount. Uh, so they are local changes, not global changes, as we've seen with both the mount a file system inside of a user namespace and the recursive shown solution. Um, so for example, I can expose the same set of files as read write in one location and uh, and another location as read only. And the two mount points don't affect each other. The, the properties of the two mount points don't affect each other. Another important property of mounts is that the changes associated with them uh, or with a specific mount are tied to the lifetime of the mount. So they are not reflected on disk or remembered in any form and thus they, uh, they aren't persistent, meaning they are temporary. They only exist as long as the mount exists. And what is missing, obviously, is the ability to change ownership on a per mount basis, uh, similar to how we would change the read only property on a per mount basis. And this is, this is not something that the kernel knows how to do or knew how to do, I should, I should say. Uh, so this is where the idea of ID map mounts comes into play. As we have seen earlier in the presentation, the kernel already has a concept that allows to change ownership on a file system wide basis by making a file system mountable inside of a user namespace. But we have seen it is not just limited to few file systems of which most aren't interesting to us, but it is also a file system wide change. So this really won't help us. Um, and I DMAP mounts start with the idea that file ownership really should be expressed on a per mount basis instead of on a file system wide basis. So the motivating use case for this exists, uh, but even if um, uh, the motivating use cases we mentioned before exist, uh, but even if they didn't, it seems like something that would be generally uh, useful. Especially in a world where you, where the coupling between names and specific UIDs and GIDs is rather arbitrary and where different operating systems uh, and the respective file systems have to or want to interact with each other. Uh, so at their core, ID map mounts make it possible to alter ownership on a per mount basis. So they allow locally and temporarily restricted exposure of a set of files under different ownership um, than the file system mount does. Obviously, you can also ID map a whole file, uh, file system. So let's go back to our uh, use cases. So portable home directories and um, containers. The idea behind portable home directories was to make it possible, just to recap this quickly, uh, to take your home directory from one computer to the next and transparently use it on both. Specifically, all file system interactions should work equally well on both computers independent of the assigned login UID and GID, which might be different. So shown and mounting inside of a user namespace didn't allow for a clean solution. Um, but with an ID map mount, we can specify an ID mapping that transparently maps the UID and GID on disk to another UID and GID. So this means I can map the UID and GID on disk to, for example, the assigned login UID and GID on that computer and expose the home directory with this ID mapping. Another neat consequence of this uh, is that it allows us to assign random login UIDs and GIDs in, in the future, which is desirable as well. Um, so we don't really need to take care, uh, need to care about the on-disk ownership anymore as much on kernels and file systems where ID map mounts are actually supported. Um, so another set of use cases uh, we had seen came from unprivileged 
containers. So containers making use of username spaces. And for uh, the containers root of us, we always need to ensure that the on disk ownership needs to correspond to the ID mapping of the containers username spaces we've seen um, in order for the container to interact with the file system. And this again can either be achieved by choning or by mounting the file system inside of a username space. But again, we've seen that this is problematic. So with ID map mounts, we can simply attach the ID mapping of the container's username space to the rootFS mount of the container and be done. And the other use case we mentioned is uh, sharing data between the host and the container or between the container with different ID mappings. And in both scenarios, choning and mounting inside of a user namespace really don't work. With ID map mounts, we can simply attach the ID mapping again to the user namespace of the respective containers um, to the mounts of the shared directory and files and expose them to the containers. So all of the use cases that we've seen above uh, are actually nicely handled by ID map mounts. So uh, let's briefly look at a demo. We don't have a lot of time to do an extensive demo of this, but I can sort of hopefully get the idea across. Uh, first of all, I want to show you how ID map mounts can be used to map one ID to another ID. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to do is uh, to create an ID map mount of my home directory and expose it at a different location. So as you've seen, my home directory, there is a bunch of files in there, as we have seen. Uh, whoop. And we have seen that there is a bunch of uh, there is a bunch of files owned by UID and GID 1000. And let's say, for example, I want to establish an ID mapping where UID 1000 is mapped to UID. 1001 so you can mount ID mapped so this is a little tool that I've written um, it's available on my github um, there's a sub command called map mount um, and then the B stands for both so map both UIDs and GIDs and map UID 1000 to UID 1001 and only this one ID and uh, apply this to my home directory and expose it at the mount point slash mount. Okay, let's do this. Again, if you look into look here, you can see all files are owned by UID and GID 1000. Now let's go into slash mount where I mounted this file system. ID mapped. Uh, by the way, you can also you can do grab uh, ID mapped. And then you can see, ah, okay, cool. Uh, it's exposed uh, ID mapped. So same thing, but now all files here appear as owned by 1000, 1000, apart from this dot we get hosts file that was owned by UID zero for which I didn't establish any sort of mapping. My user right here, my uh, user, I'm uh, running with ID 1000. Ugh. Um, so I can't really create any files in here. I can't do anything. It uh, gives me uh, uh, e-overflow, which is uh, kernel speak for this ID is not mapped. But if I map in as my test user, uh, I should learn how to write. Ha. Um, my test user has ID 1001, 1001, and now I can create files in that directory. Cool. And if I look at them with the ID mapping established in here, I can see they are owned by my UID and GID 1000. So BBB is here, uh, A is there. But cool thing is, if I look at this within my from within my home directory, I can see that they are owned by UID and GID 1000. So they are written back with the correct UID and GID, UID 1000, which is how I would want them uh, to appear on disk. This also avoids issues such as, for example, you go to a different workstation where you have a different ID, 
and uh, then you end up with a mixture of ID 1000 and ID, I don't know, 1235 uh, uh, on there. And you end up with a mixture of files you can't really do anything with. Um, yes. This is the first example. This is, for example, the home, home, uh, portable home directory example. You can see how you can create um, ID map mounts of uh, your local home directory. Um, now let's let's look at a use case for uh, containers. Um, let's uh, launch a new container. Um, images. Uh, suit H1, I think that's the current release. Creating a new container, <clears throat> unpacking. It takes a bit of time. Um, that's it, it's, it's rather quick as you can see. And the reason why it is that quick is uh, because we don't need to recursively churn the root file system. You will see this in a bit. We can do H1 and uh, everything will look fine. The root file system will look uh, good apart from proc and sys, but that's okay because they're always owned by nobody, no group. No group. And uh, then uh, we can take a look at the root file system of the container from outside. Just val lib lexd, we'll take a, a shortcut uh, rootfs and, and we can see on disk it's owned by uid and gid uh, zero. So we haven't recursively uh, changed uh, ownership at all. We just applied the uh, ID mapping, which is exactly, which is exactly what we want. Uh, in contrast, if we look at other containers, I hope I even have still containers that uh, have an ID mapping applied. I do. So for another container which doesn't use ID map mounts, we needed to show all of the files to according to the ID mapping of the container in order to be able to interact with them. So this problem is solved. Um, uh, with ID map mounts, we don't need to do this. So now let's look at the case where we expose a um, directory that we want to share between um, the container and uh, the host. You can uh, Lexd allows to do this. Lexi config device add. We tell it which container. Uh, we give this device a name. In this case, my share. We tell it that this is a disk device. It has a source path, which in our case will be home browner, um, which is my home directory. Um, and we want to attach it to my share. And we want to say apply an ID map mount to it. Well, actually, for, uh, for fun, let's not do this right away. Uh, let's just add this to my container. Let's go into this container and then access my share. And you can see like all of the files are owned by nobody, no group. I can't really do anything right here. Permission is denied because I, I, I don't have permissions to create any files. And it's, it's really not very useful um, for me, uh, as you can see. I can't open files. I can't uh, write to files. Not great. So uh, let's uh, remove this and uh, add the device, but this time we tell XD, please uh, inject the, uh, the share as uh, an ID map mount. And so we'll do this. We go into the container. Um, we see there is a mount for my share. And then we go into my share and we can see there is an ID map mount applied. All of the UIDs and GIDs uh, appear correctly owned. I can write files. Uh, I can, I'm not using X, so whatever. Um, and uh, I can create files. If I look at them from the outside, we will see that they are correctly owned. Yep, looks nice because as in the container we created files as the root user. Uh, don't be fooled. If I were to log into the container as Ubuntu H1 and then go into my share and do touch the, and then look at it from the outside, you'd see that it's correctly owned by UID and GID um, 1000. 
so exactly what we want. And the really beautiful thing about this is that if we haven't created uh, um, a hole in the containers ID map, and we didn't need to do this. So if I add the same my home directory at a different location, my share two, and I don't apply an, uh, well, I should rename it obviously, uh, and I don't apply an ID mapping to it, I will have exposed it right here once with the ID mapping applied and once without the ID mapping applied. Um, and so I can, I can very finely control what actually, what access the container will actually have to a set of files. So I hope this sort of gave you an impression of, of how powerful this, uh, this mechanism actually is. Um, so right, uh, let's summarize it. I think we're uh, slowly uh, coming towards the end. Um, so as we can see, ID map mounts really greatly expand the usability of file systems on Linux. That's at least the hope. And they provide a localized temporary way of exposing the same set of files at multiple locations with different ownership. And the lifetime of these ownership changes is bound to the lifetime of the mount and the changes are restricted to the mount. And the change in ownership, uh, something which I haven't stressed so far is instantaneous, which because it's pretty obvious, I think. So there is no cost even remotely close to what a recursive chone uh, would cost you. And it's a single system call that allows you to change ownership. ID map mounts can be created for a whole mount tree. So they can be created recursively um, that's the, the API was designed so that you can change the uh, ownership of a set of mounts in one go and a bunch and other mount properties as well uh, for what it's worth. And ID map mounts aren't uh, an, a, a container feature or exclusively a container feature. They are useful for containers, but they are not just designed for containers. This is important to notice. They have major use cases outside and completely independent of containers, a portable home directory use case just being a very obvious example. And they allow us to solve a, a major set of use cases. So ID map mounts are currently supported starting with kernel 5.12. They are supported by X4, XFS and WeFAT. Currently file systems need to implement support for ID map mounts. It's, it's not a very complicated change usually apart from uh, uh, only if you have a special file system. And with the release of kernel 5.15, ButterFS is supported as well. I, uh, we merged this in, yeah, we merged this in the 5.15 merge window. And in the future, we will see support for even more file systems. So if you want to know how ID map mounts are created, including a sample program, I would ask you to check out the Linux man page project. Uh, on the website, your distro usually doesn't have an updated uh, man page version or a new enough man page version, or you might, might not even be running a, a, a new enough kernel. And uh, the man page is uh, uh, quite extensive and it ex uh, ex aims to explain the API in great detail. And with that, I hope you uh, enjoyed this, this talk and I wish you a uh, rest great rest of the conference, uh, whether it is uh, virtual or in person. And if you're in person, please uh, have a beer for me as well. And thanks, see you. <laughs>